Support for Louisiana, the state we're in, is provided by... Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Silicon Valley had so many uninsured depositors compared to insured depositors. Will the Silicon Valley bank failure affect us in Louisiana? They were going to attempt to do a recall of the mayor. The mayoral recall petition in New Orleans explained. I don't think it's out of the possibility in the next 24 months that this service could start. A train ride from Baton Rouge to New Orleans is closer to becoming reality. So with the higher resource limit, it allowed more people to be eligible during that time period. Louisiana families coping with reduced SNAP benefits. Hi everyone, as the move toward legalizing marijuana and hemp products sweeps the nation, Louisiana is trying to step back and unring a bell that opened the door for the sale of such THC products. Yeah, this week, a judge blocked enforcement of an attempted crackdown on legal THC. Two months ago, ATC agents began slamming the brakes on sales, igniting lawsuits and pushback from thousands of state retailers. Yeah, it's expected to be a hot topic when the legislature opens April 10th. Yeah, you can bet that. And now here are some other headlines from around the state. A new business startup accelerator program funded by Techstars and state economic development will give entrepreneurs across the state the opportunity to apply for venture capital funding and business development resources. Techstars is a global investment business that provides access to capital, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, and programming for those just starting out. Longtime state insurance commissioner Jim Donilon won't seek re-election in October. He made the announcement this week. Donilon is busy working to move the state past the ongoing property insurance crisis. The devastating hurricanes of 2020 and 21 fueled the crisis, and insurance companies dropped policies or simply went under. Donilon has been commissioner for 17 years, and he spent a total of 50 years in service to the public. Shell Oil will invest $10 million with New Orleans-based Gulf Wind Technology for the project to develop wind power generation products designed to operate in the Gulf. The first turbine for the project is expected to be ready for demonstration as early as next year. In 1969, man first went to the moon, and a passenger train last rolled between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. There have been attempts to revive it, but it hasn't so far. So why is this week seeming like chances are better than ever to make that happen? The top person to talk about that is John Spain, executive VP of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, also on the Southern Rail Commission. And uh, why is this week so important? With this news. Well, I'm so glad you asked yes. because as we sit here earlier today, the Surface Transportation Board approved the sale of Kansas City Southern to Canadian Pacific. And what your viewers need to know is that is the track that we're going to use to run the service between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Kansas City Southern, the current owner, really didn't want us to do it. Canadian Pacific, the new owner, is Amtrak's number one passenger partner. So it's significant that we've got a freight operator who will own the tracks and say, we are in favor of running Baton Rouge to New Orleans. Now, Baton Rouge Area Foundation has, this is something that you guys have studied and the 
It's overwhelming, the support for it. It's part of Amtrak's vision uh, for the years ahead. They included this. And so uh, things seem to be aligning. What are we talking about in terms of actuality? And there are things that need to happen, of there course. There are things but. that need to happen, but, you know, I people ask me that all the time, and the answer is I don't really know, but I would tell you I don't think it's out of the possibility in the next 24 months that this service could start, maybe really? sooner, you know, but we don't know. But the, the critical piece is that Amtrak says they're going to do it. It's on their map, right. okay? Canadian Pacific, the new owner, has said in a press conference in New Orleans, we want to do this. The Federal Railroad Administration that provides funding for these projects has been in those meetings, and the administrator in that same press conference in New Orleans said, we will provide funding. And of course, Governor Edwards has been an advocate for this for many right. years. So all the parties are together. We just have to kind of get some of these few details put together, and I think we're getting close. And one of the things that's not a problem that typically would be a problem, at least not the biggest problem, is the money, because there's big federal support, and the state wants it too. And every stop along the way is also interested in this, all the parishes involved. The vice president, who's now the president, Joe Biden, was in New Orleans back in 2017, met with a number of us. Uh, people may not know this, but he's called Amtrak Joe. Okay. And he's a strong advocate of rail because early in his life, being a member of Congress, his first wife and one of his children were killed in an automobile accident. And he pledged the remaining kids that he'd be home every night. And he literally wrote an Amtrak train back to Delaware from Washington and got the nickname of Amtrak Joe. All right. And when we were meeting back in 2017, he said, you know, President Obama and I are really, really pleased that we're going to give the state $300 million to start this train. And we were all delighted. And of course, the previous governor turned that money right. down. Right. And so we've been working ever since. And the good news is the president, uh, Biden has put together a package in the infrastructure bill of about $30 billion specifically used for rail. It can't be used for bridges, it can't be used for highways, it's just rail. And that's good for this. It is good for this. Yeah. So the money that is generally the reason why these things don't happen is available. The state has to apply and the good news is uh, Governor Edwards and the Department of Transportation have applied for the money to do some of the improvements on the track. So all the pieces seem to be in place to make this happen. There's reconstruction that needs to happen for a stretch along the Bonnie Carey Spillway. And there's also a stretch along I-20 in North Louisiana from Alabama to Texas that's also green-lighted, I should say, I guess. And does that compete with this or it just no. runs in harmony with no, it? No, in fact, it's complimentary okay. because it means that lawmakers in our legislature from all over the state now are talking about the need to have alternative ways of moving people in freight and commerce. And what's exciting about the North Louisiana train is that Amtrak runs a daily service from New Orleans to Atlanta to Washington. And uh, that train runs through Meridian, Mississippi. And they're simply going to split that train at Meridian. Part of it will go to Dallas. Part of it will continue going to New Orleans. So while we have some more work to do, that one's pretty simple. And Amtrak has publicly said they're going to do that. Well, for every reason, we seem to be encouraged uh, with this news, right? We, we are very, very excited. There's a little more work to do. But I think that light we see is, in fact, a train this time, <laughs> right? A green light. A green yeah. light, exactly. Well, it's exciting. John, um, I'm so glad to talk about this. One thing I haven't asked you, and I will quickly, what kind of train are we talking about? It won't be like a speed Euro train, will No, it? this train will run about 90 miles an hour. Okay. Okay, but remember, it's only about 90 miles yeah, right. between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. So it'll take a little over an hour. What we talk about is it's predictable. When you get on the train, we'll tell you how long it's going to take to get from here to there. That's not true on I-10. We no. all think we can go down there and we'll get there in a little over an hour, but then something happens. That is a big need for this. It is. And the thing that also reminds people is these are evacuation trains. Yeah. When we look back to Katrina, we put people in the dome. Unfortunately, we lost people in that. Right, right. Major storms, we have a few days' notice. We can put these trains in New Orleans. We can bring people out of hospitals, out of nursing homes, get them out of harm's way. Yeah, for every reason, it seems to make sense, doesn't it? It used to be here. Yeah, it used we're, to be here. We're just, as you started out, we're, we're going back to what we <laughs> yeah, had. And right. hopefully it's better, and I hope people will, will use it. And from all the polling and conversations yeah. and work we've done, we think there's overwhelming support for it. Well, I'm fired up. John, thank you so much for being here. Well, will you ride the train with me? I absolutely will. Then I'll see you on the train. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you.
America's top 20 banks failed last weekend, plummeting the rest of the country into what feels like chaos. Silicon Valley Bank in the Bay Area is no more. But questions are swarming around what might happen next and if this could affect the local banks here in Louisiana. A finance professor at Tulane University says don't panic. And Friday marks the end of a rough week for the banking industry. Last weekend, the Silicon Valley Bank entered crisis mode. Increasing fallout following the historic collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Concerns growing over the stability of what was a tech-focused lender in the Valley. It's the 16th largest bank in the U.S., and publications throw around words like bank collapse, bank failure, and loss. Words we haven't heard much of since the recession in 2008. But what do these words really mean? What actually happened? What happened with Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley, Valley took deposits from a large group of depositors in, as you may have guessed, Silicon Valley. And during the pandemic, these, these startups and these businesses had a lot of cash, as, as, as you may have imagined. Now, as the money started drying up, these businesses needed to draw down on this cash. They needed to draw down on these deposits that were being held at the bank. A typical bank will take deposits and pay the depositor an interest rate and use that money to loan out. The Silicon Valley Bank did that, but they also took deposit money and bought long-dated treasuries, which is a fancy phrase that basically means the bank loaned money to the federal government for a certain amount of time. They also bought mortgage-backed securities. Treasury securities, very, very safe. This is a very low credit risk product. So there was, there's not a lot of risk of the Treasury defaulting. However, with inflationary press, pressures, the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates, and this has an opposing effect on, on bond prices. So the price of the Treasury started go, of these Treasury securities started going down. The bank then started to sell those securities at a loss, a $1.8 billion loss. And that's where things start to go downhill. Some venture capital companies got wind of the security sales and advised its clients to pull their money out of the bank, triggering what's called a bank run. The bank was actually shut down to prevent this run from getting even worse than it already was on Friday during business hours. So how does this affect us in Louisiana? In short, it doesn't, not really. Let me explain. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation insures deposits up to $250,000 now, which means that your money is safe if a bank goes under, as long as your bank holdings don't exceed that $250,000 figure. Most local banks in Louisiana don't service depositors with holdings above that number, so a bank run would be unlikely and also very unnecessary. The FDIC would give you your money back. The fact that Silicon Valley had so many uninsured depositors compared to insured depositors is something that was very unique to this bank. For perspective, more than 80% of SVB's depositors were uninsured. Most were tech startups and giants in the industry, so it makes sense. But the national average for that type of depositor is about 40%. It's likely the rest of the country is safe too. Some are afraid that this bank run could trigger another recession, like what we saw in 2008 when the Washington Mutual Bank failed. But that's not likely either. That recession revolved around the housing market crash, which is not the case with SVB. Banking system is safe. Your deposits will be there when you need them. Small businesses across the country, the deposit accounts at these banks can breathe easier knowing they'll be able to pay their workers and pay their bills. In a press conference Monday, President Joe Biden said, number one, all depositors in the bank will have access to their money immediately without the burden being placed on taxpayers. Number two, the FDIC seized the bank and the managers of the bank were all fired. Number three, investors in the bank won't be reimbursed. Number four, his administration would look into the root cause. And lastly, that he'd also look into reducing the risk of this ever happening again. As for the Silicon Valley Bank, it was put up for auction. The whole process has to, has to resolve within 90 days. And the way a typical bank failure works is that there is an auction and there is an auction, there is a winner of this auction, and that, that auction winner acquires the failed bank. And to the average person, this shift usually goes unnoticed. So long story short, SVB did fail, but Louisiana depositors shouldn't worry. Your money is safe.
We are now halfway through the first month in almost three years where extra SNAP benefits have ended. These are benefits that began with the pandemic. An extension for most states ended March 1st. Monica Brown is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Children and Family Services, is here with us now. And I'm wondering, Monica, have you noticed calls from people who are having difficulty with the change in the extra benefits? There have been some calls, but it hasn't been to the extreme we expected. And I think it has a lot to do with that. We did a lot of things to prepare for this. Um, and like some, some of the things that we did were, um, uh, we've been communicating with them from the beginning almost since we started getting the extension. Since the extra benefits began. Right, we started giving them notice that we were getting the extension because we had to apply for the extension every month. Oh, okay. So one of the things we have is an opt-in where you opt in for texting. So we were uh, telling the people who had the opt-in method that, hey, we are got the extension this month. So they knew that this was a monthly thing that we were getting. So it wasn't something that was, you know, uh, not known that it was temporary. So there was an, an awareness. It still has hit everybody hard. So I would say one of the things that we had done as uh, as an agency, as a department, is we looked at the things that would change. So we had um, what is called broad-based category eligibility, which allowed us to make more people eligible. So it's based on um, the poverty level. Okay. So with more people being eligible on the poverty level and allowing us to have more people who have resources, we had a, a resource limit that was relatively low. So with the higher resource limit, it allowed more people to be eligible during that time period. So that still stands. So some of those things that we put in place are still there. Okay. Um, also, one of the things that we put into place is that our TANF, which is our cash assistance, um, that grant went up. So the grant amounts went up and almost doubled. We had one of the lowest grant amounts, um, you know, as far as nationwide. And so we doubled the grant amount. The grant amount previously was 240 for a household of three, is now um, 480, uh, 484 to be exact. And the uh, amount for um, kinship, which is when a grandparent or an auntie has the children mm -hmm. instead of the parent. When they have kinship care, um, they're getting now, instead of $222 per child, they're getting 450 per child. But we're a state with one of the highest hunger rates. Yes. Uh, one in seven people, one in five children, which is alarming mm -hmm. uh, in the nation. But uh, so it was necessary to get those amounts up to a more fair level, I would think, right? Right, it, right. So these are things that we have been adding to. And even now with this coming, we are looking at two other things that are coming up. Um, we have um, a standard medical deduction that's going to help and allow uh, our standard, standard medical deduction is going to add if a person shows that they have, and they're disabled or senior, and they have $35 and a penny, they'll get the whole standard deduction of 195, I believe it is, and that's going to up what their actual amount of their stamp, uh, of their benefit amount will be. What are some of the things that people can do though right now if um, they're feeling the squeeze? Okay, well, I think we need to make sure your amount is right. Because you were getting the full benefit amount for the last three years, a lot of people have not told us that there may have been a household change. Right, so verify so, what you have in the household. Right, let's talk to us, tell us what, sure. what's going on. So it is important to give us that call and tell us, you know, how many people are in the household. Let's make sure that if you had an increase, maybe a baby was born. Sure. Um, let's talk about um, if you have an increase in expenses. So if there's been um, more shelter expenses. Um, if you have court ordered child support and that you're paying out into your from your household, let's talk about that because those are expenses that are um, counting. You sure. Know? So when we budget, let's talk about what we're budgeting. Well, it sounds like you guys have communicated with with anyone receiving benefits from the beginning, and you continue to. But it's a two way street, and um, if you need help, other assistance go to that also, whether it's a food bank, churches, et cetera. Right, and call 211. 211. Right, and you know, I, there's a big push right now because we're looking at grants too out there, and the farmer's markets are really good extensions of what we can do. So they offer more um, matching benefits. Some of them, they're different amounts, but it's really good to get out there to the farmer's markets. It's a lot of information, but it's, it's a lot when you're hungry, isn't it? 
it's yes. uh, something we all need to be aware of. Monica, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. The controversial mayoral recall petition in New Orleans continues as both sides argue over the legitimacy of the signatures. Matt Sledge, a reporter who's been following the story, gives us a timeline. So the Cantrell administration has been really scrutinized a lot since the pandemic, and now there seems to be a recall petition that's coming out where people want to actually remove her from office. How did New Orleans get here? So it's a, a pretty interesting chain of events. Uh, Cantrell was widely praised for her handling of the COVID pandemic. She shut down businesses when a lot of business owners didn't want her to. And then in 2021, uh, she ran for re-election for her second term, was able to kind of clear the field. No one with a lot of serious political backing ran against her, and she won a very convincing victory for her second term. Almost immediately, the problems started coming out of the woodwork. Um, crime was already high in New Orleans post-pandemic, and it just kept going up in 2021 and, and 2022. And the mayor, uh, her critics would say, just couldn't seem to get a handle on the problem. Her, her police department never came out with a very convincing plan uh, for how they were gonna respond to the rise in crime. Over the course of 2022, um, in addition to crime, there were all sorts of other issues like road work problems. Everybody who's, who's driven around New Orleans knows the streets are a mess. They've been a mess for years at this point. Um, and then there was a series of personal issues, personal controversies involving the mayor that came out. Um, the, big, the first big one was the first class flights she took to overseas destinations on taxpayer expense. Um, you know, the mayor was initially very reluctant to repay taxpayers for those flights. Um, so there was, there was this, you know, kind of uh, uh, soup brewing of, of issues um, involving the city and involving the mayor personally. And then on August 26th of last year, uh, two people, one of them Eileen Carter, a former staffer for the mayor, she was actually the mayor's social media manager, and then one uh, Belden Nooney man, Batiste, um, who's a, a kind of activist, shows up to a bunch of city council meetings, runs for a lot of political offices. Um, together they filed a formal notice that they were going to attempt to do a recall of the mayor. That was on August 26th of last year. There was a lot of uncertainty when their efforts started uh, about how serious it was going to be, whether it was going to have legs, um, and then almost immediately they had a very large uh, signature signing event in Lakeview that drew hundreds and hundreds of people and showed uh, that at, at a bare minimum there was uh, some enthusiasm for this effort. So before we talk a little bit more about the recall that's going on right now, first let's let's backpedal a little bit. I mean, are recalls even common in Louisiana? Yeah, it's really interesting. Every state has its own rules for how recalls can go forward. Many states don't have any kind of recall at all. Louisiana used to set one of the highest bars for a, a recall in the nation. You had to have a third of active voters um, sign your, your petition. Um, a few years back, a uh, state representative on the North Shore decided that was too high of a bar. So he authored legislation that reduced the trigger from a third to a fifth of, of registered voters. And that has made it a lot easier to at least attempt to do a recall. Uh, that, that's not to say there have been many successful recall attempts since then. It's still very hard to collect enough signatures to actually get on the ballot. Um, talking to recall experts, once you do get on the ballot, once voters do have that yes or no question of whether to retain a politician, your odds, um, your chances of success increase dramatically. So for this recall petition, I mean, what's the latest on that? Is it, is it likely that this one's gonna be successful? As you and I sit here today, it's really hard to, to say the answer to that question. Uh, the deadline for the recall organizers to turn in their signatures was February 22nd, Ash Wednesday. They did that with a lot of pomp and circumstance. They dropped off the boxes an hour before deadline. They had a brass band playing. They declared victory. But all throughout this process, they have refused to give us a specific number of how many signatures they have collected. 
So we don't even know their estimate of how many signatures uh, they've collected, let alone how many of the Orleans Parish Registrar voters whose job it is to count these things will say are valid. So where do you go from here if nobody knows how many signatures you have? Uh, we go ahead to March 22nd. That's the registrar's deadline for verifying these things. And presumably we will know on that date or soon after whether she thinks they have enough valid signatures. Um, just given the way things have been going, I wouldn't be surprised either way um, if she says yes they made it or no they didn't get there if there are more lawsuits, further litigation over all of this. So suppose this recall is successful. What does that mean for New Orleans? Well, if, if this thing goes to a ballot, then there's going to be an up or down vote on the mayor. And if people vote to recall the mayor, we are probably in for months and months of uncertainty about what happens next. Um, uh, one of the city council members will be placed in position as acting mayor. And then there will be another election uh, to replace the mayor for the rest of the term. Um, that could potentially go into a runoff. So we could keep having elections and uncertainty until April 2024. And there's definitely a new precedent that will be set whenever it comes to recalling politicians as well. I think so. I think it's, it's very possible we could see more recall campaigns in Louisiana as a result of this. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It'll be interesting to see how that all pans out. And everyone, happy St. Patrick's Day and March Madness is in full swing now. And that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB PBS app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.